This is the Holocaust and Genocide Lecture Series. I'm Diane Parness, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to what I think you will find a most scintillating and exciting semester of lectures from some of the most prominent students of genocide that we can offer you. Our theme for 2015 is a century of genocide. And I'm unfortunately sure that as we review this dark century of genocide, you will find many of the descriptions we depict very familiar, chillingly familiar. And that's why we always say genocide is not something that we can relegate to the history books. Genocide is something that we have to be constantly vigilant about, and particularly today. We are always delighted, and we are genuinely privileged to welcome back two people who have been among the most popular speakers in our lecture series for years, many years. As long as we can, it's imperative that we listen to the words of those who were there, the words of the survivors, of those who have a story that only they can tell, and obviously their number is dwindling. Two of those compelling stories will be told to us this semester by Hans Angres and Paul Schwarzbart. Don't miss them. We felt compelled to mark this year's series as a century of genocide because 2015 is the centennial of the Armenian genocide, as horrific a genocide as any that we will study in this course, and one that is still very controversial. In 2015, a hundred years later, still denied by many, especially its perpetrators. We are very fortunate to welcome back Professor Sergio Laporta, who will present you with a masterful account of the causes and the effects of the Armenian Genocide. And we will then have the opportunity to see the genocide through the eyes of the filmmaker, Barad Moronian, who is presenting for us a special screening of his award-winning film, Orphans of the Genocide. We will then have the opportunity to welcome longtime dean of the School of Social Sciences, Professor Elaine Leader, who will share her experience as one of the second generation, the children of the survivors. And her trip to Lithuania last summer was the culmination of a lifetime of dealing with that onerous legacy to be a child of a survivor and the lasting effects thereof. Uh, her story is moving and compelling, and again, this is one that you should not miss. For many years, we have tried to bring one of the premier scholars of the Holocaust to Sonoma State, and this year we succeeded. So, Professor Christopher Browning will be presenting his discussion, the Adele Zeigelbaum Memorial Lecture resisting the perpetrators. You're going to be reading Dr. Browning's account of ordinary men and their role in the Holocaust in Poland. His work is one of the most highly, highly regarded in the vast body of work on the Holocaust. And shortly thereafter, you will enjoy one of our favorite lecturers in this series, and again, for many years, Professor James Waller speaks of becoming evil. Dr. Waller's work goes beyond history. It goes beyond political science. It embraces psychology, sociology, economics, and many other points of view for the critical question of genocide. Why and how do ordinary people become evil? This is our Robert L. Harris Memorial Lecture, and you will also hear at the beginning of that lecture of the important work of the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust and Genocide here at Sonoma State University and in Sonoma County. This semester, we're going to welcome several new lecturers to the series. Professors Anna Bracic, Alex Alvarez, and Eric Nielsen 
will consider three 21st century topics on genocide. The ongoing plight of the Roma in Europe, climate change, scarcity of resources, and the possibility of genocide, and the abiding tragedy of Darfur. One of our speakers is a favorite of this series because of who she is, because of the story that she has to tell, and because of the incredible work that she has done in genocide education for us and the process of healing for the people of Rwanda. She too has been with this series for many years and we are very fortunate to again bring to Sonoma State University someone who very recently added a bunch of titles to her name. We would call her Matilde, but she is the Honorable Ambassador Matilde Mukantabana of the Republic of Rwanda to the United States. So please be sure to listen to her story. This course offers many topics and much diversity. So it's up to us to bring everything together and to offer you a template for understanding the consistencies and the commonalities of genocide. Professor Goodman will speak to you about Raphael Lemkin and the concept of genocide. We're very happy again to have Professor Preisner, who will speak to you about the origins of anti-Semitism in Europe. And today, I'm going to tell you a bit about the stage for the Shoah, the Weimar Republic. Are we operating, Andrew? Uh -oh. oh, no, no, leave it to me. I'll be right with you. PowerPoint, my mark. Okay. See, it's not just the audio visual system, it's the professors as usual. Once again, I'm going to start the semester with a quote from the notorious, the evil Joseph Goebbels, who said, it will always remain one of the best jokes of democracy that it gave its deadly enemies the means by which it was destroyed. What did he mean? Well, the story of Weimar, we see what he meant. Keep in mind, always, the Nazis did not destroy Weimar to come to power. The Nazis used Weimar to come to power. They took advantage of Weimar's processes and its institutions. Weimar was the victim of democide. It was the victim of too much democracy, as the noted American sociologist Ralph Darmdorf often stated, Weimar was a democracy without Democrats, a republic without Republicans. Weimar was a system that nobody really knew what to do with. It was completely alien to the German people. Soon we'll have slides, maybe. How you doing, Andrew? Oh, okay. okay. We'll show you all of the ones. Well, the first slide is one you really have to kind of see, because what I meant to show you was one of the grand events of the early 20th century. Oh, okay. Next one. Ah, there we are. This was the funeral of Edward VII of Great Britain. And it was the last occasion and the reason I show it to you is because it was the last occasion when you saw the great royalty of Europe all in one place. Next one, Andrew. And this is a very well-known photograph of nine of the sovereigns of Europe who were at the funeral of Edward VII. And here you see, for the most part, a fated group. On the far left, King Haakon of Norway. He wasn't so fated. He, he made it through. Nothing bad happened up there. Next to him is Tsar Ferdinand of Bulgaria. 
who would, shortly thereafter, abdicate. Next to him, King Manuel II of Portugal, who would be driven from his throne and exiled in England during the Revolution of October 1910. Next to him, we have Kaiser Bill, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. And, as you will know, he will be exiled just before the onset of the Weimar Republic and spend the remainder of his days in the Netherlands. Next to him, we have George I of Greece. He would be assassinated in Salonika. And next to him, King Albert I of Belgium, who by the end of World War I would be relegated to a tiny corner of an already pretty tiny country. And never really braved again. Seated from left to right, King Alfonso XIII of Spain, another who's in exile. Next to him, someone who did all right. Uh, King George V of Great Britain, he stayed around. And then King Frederick of Denmark, who also would come through the war. Missing from this portrait, but also present at the funeral, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria, the alleged reason whose assassination was the alleged reason for the outbreak of World War I in Sarajevo, June 1914. And also, Prince Michael Alexandrovich of Russia, murdered by the Bolsheviks in 1917. It wasn't a good time for crowns. It wasn't a good time for empire. By the close of World War I, the age of empire is over. The old order is defeated. Something needs to fill the vacuum. But what? The Germans sue for peace. And in the process of suing for peace, they try to do what they feel will most suit the fancy of the British and the French. Because those are the people that by this point they realize they have to appease because they're the ones who are going to set the terms of the armistice. Weimar begins with a political revolution, the abdication of the Kaiser on November the 10th, the signing of the armistice on November the 11th, and military defeat, which was never accepted by many in Germany. This produced in Germany what we might call an eruption of politicization. Everyone becomes political. A lot of people become political. They don't know how to manage it. They don't have the institutions that can channel that overt politicization. It was suddenly almost impossible not to be political in Weimar, and this in a culture that had had next to no experience of popular political involvement. Here you see the communists marching in Berlin. Elsewhere in Germany you would see the far right marching for an altogether different purpose. We might speak of three main phases in the history of Weimar. The first phase from 1918 to 1923, when the parties of the left, the moderate left, and the center control the political stage. The second phase in Weimar's history, 1924 to 1929, period of relative stability. We don't associate Weimar with stability, but there was some. And during this period, it was mostly the center-right that was calling the political shots. Finally, of course, 1930 to 1933, more and more chaos, more and more outrage, and the rise of the authoritarian right in Germany. As Eric Weitz suggests, 
the first two stages in Weimar's history represented Weimar's potential. And Weimar had a great deal of potential. The last represented its pathologies. And its pathologies, what killed Weimar, was not simply the product of Nazism. It wasn't simply the product of the far right. It was the product of the collective, of its divisions, of its, for want of a better word, well, I think it is a good word, tribalism, political tribalism. Each period, each of these three main periods in Weimar's history, failed as the result of a political and an economic crisis. Each also suffered the ineptitude of several governments, not just one or two. Each period had to withstand several governments because Weimar had no political stability because of its political tribalism. Many spoke of the political revolution that came in 1918 with the abdication of the Kaiser. But the revolution of 1918 was not a revolution in any genuine sense. Because although we had a completely different political system, we had no final break with Germany's own political and economic traditions. And those were not democratic traditions. One of my favorite authors on Germany, Gordon Craig, remarks, the Republic of 1919 was an improvised regime in which too many important positions remained in the hands of those people whose primary allegiance was to the past. That's the truth. Very, very different in 1918 than in 1945, when <laughs> the Germans had no choice. That was wiped away. Well, they still have those kinds of problems. But in 1945, the Germans speak of Stunde Null, the zero hour. This is when things had to begin truly anew. That didn't happen in 1918. So that polit political tradition was one that recognized neither the theory nor the practice of self-government and popular sovereignty. We did, didn't accept the value of that. Germany had no natural law tradition. The tradition that inspired the demand for personal freedom and the right of the people to control the leaders that they had elected the Enlightenment had failed to take hold in Germany. Germans viewed the German nation as a unique cultural expression, not a part of the Western Enlightenment tradition. And they were very proud of that. Yeah? But that would also prove their demise. Despite all of this, at the outset, the outlook wasn't completely awful for Weimar. In the first elections to the Reichstag, 80% of all eligible voters voted. That's about twice what we do. The pro-Republican parties, the parties that backed the Weimar experiment, and these would be, first and foremost, the SPD, which still survives very well, the Social Democratic Party of Germany, the DDP, the German Democratic Party, which was a liberal party in the European sense, and the Z party, the Centrum, the Center Party, which was your classic Christian political party, which you see in almost every country, of, particularly of Western Europe. They received 75% of the vote. That's good. That gives them a lot of support. That gives them a basis. But the reason people voted for them 
is because they were scared to death of what would happen if they didn't support them. They were worried about an extreme. But it wasn't the right. They were worried in 1918 about who? Communists. The communists. Because what had just happened? Yeah. That little uproar in Russia. Yeah. So and that's the idea, isn't it? That's, that's the Marxist vision. It wasn't necessarily the Leninist vision at the time, but they didn't know that. So they just feel the Reds are going to be at the door any minute. So better this devil we know than that horrible devil that we don't, that is coming inevitably. They would have elections. Oh, next one, please. Soon after its founding, Weimar would be resented. It would be resented by, firstly, the right, the moderate right, yeah, who associated the republic with shame, with weakness, and with dishonor. Secondly, it would be resented by the center, who blamed Weimar for their economic collapse. And thirdly, it would be resented by the left, who were hell-bent for leather to conquer Europe with the revolution. Their moment had come. They were waiting that they could happen in Russia, where Marx never conceived of the revolution to begin. Surely it would come to where it was supposed to begin. Germany. Okay. Weimar was the product of horrendous internal political battles. From the outset, there was opposition from the right, but the right itself, neither right nor center nor left, was a unified organization. They were factionalized too. The right was composed of the moderate right, the traditional conservative right, and then, of course, the far right. And the far left, who again were wanting to ride the wave of Bolshevism. Opposition from the moderate right is most important for you to keep in mind because it is that seemingly innocuous group, the moderate right, and the moderate, they sound rather peaceful, who consistently provoked opposition to Biden and were able to do that throughout the republic. Why? If the parties of the moderate right were not part of the Weimar coalition, what influence could they exert? Where should we always expect the, or suspect, the influence of the ancien regime. Where are the bastions of conservatism in any society? Where do you find them? Who? Churches. Yes. Where else? All right. The economic elites, the wealthy. Yes. Big business. Yeah. Where else? The military. The military. Definitely. Anybody else? I usually forget, but you shouldn't. The judiciary. Mm -hmm. Judiciary, the military, business, churches, two more very important sectors. Right. Yes. You wouldn't think so coming to Sonoma State. But yes, the <laughs> education. And one more that is never immediately in the public eye, but is all bureaucracy. yes, bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. But you can't get rid of them. Even after World War II, we had to keep Nazis in the bureaucracy. Nobody else knew how to run the country. So they and they can do remarkable things to forestall the best intentions of any liberal or socialist government. We know that. So these were key players in each of these, there were key players in each of these sectors that never 
never supported by law. The right was divided too. It would never cohere until the last days of the Republic, and then only briefly. The major parties of the right in Germany were the DNVP, the German National People's Party, the DVP, the German People's Party, and then, of course, the NSDAP, the Nazis. The first two, which we don't hear so much about, but who certainly played a significant role in expediting the course of the Nazis, were generally xenophobic, specifically anti-Semitic, although not overtly. They didn't speak of the dirty Jew. They spoke of cosmopolitanism. They spoke of the flooding of Germany with people of foreign origin, and both were codes for Jews. The DNVP was the old right, once monarchist, but even in the DNVP, the love of the monarchy had pretty much gone the way of the Kaiser. He was inept and he didn't do what he should have done to assure that Germany won the war. So they were ticked off with him. They didn't advocate the return of the Kaiser so much as they advocated a military solution to the inefficacy of violence. This would be a problem. And many, of course, of the military elite strongly favored this option as well. The extreme right was also, at this point, very fragmented. It wasn't a, law, a wall of goose-stepping, uniformed Nazis that we associate with the far right of Germany. At this point, it was the expression of the alienated, and the disenfranchised, <coughs> people who didn't have someplace else to go and were looking for a common home. The frightful roving bands of people who were returning from the war had no job prospects and were just looking to get some attention and looking for something to do. These were people that the Nazis welcomed with open arms. They were at first welcomed by the Weimar government, who frankly needed some domestic political uh, police backup. And they were good people to provide that. But the Freikorps would never be converted to democracy. From the Freikorps, these political outcasts would find a home in the netherworld of Germany's extreme right. And it was a netherworld at this juncture. You know, they lived below the line of vision. They lived under the table. These groups found financial backing from a few key wealthy individuals, and that's what kept them going in the early days. Ultimately, the moderate right and the far right would share a common belief system founded in nationalism, above all else nationalism, and a common antipathy for Jews and for communists. Two months into the Republic, the communists incited revolution in Berlin and in several other major cities throughout Germany. In April of 1919, a communist republic was declared in Munich. Throughout the winter and the spring of 1919, Germany was in a veritable state of civil war. It was utter chaos. The new government was formed in Weimar because Berlin was too violent. They couldn't run the risk of forming a government, even assembly in Berlin. Such was the state of affairs. Ultimately, Friedrich Ebert would attempt to establish some order. He was the leader of the SPD. The army was quite happy to violently suppress the communist uprisings, but their reaction to the cop push, and you'll hear more about this in discussion sections, I'm sure, in March of 1920 would be very different. 
this was one of their own who was trying to stage revolution. This was an attempt at a military overthrow of the Weimar government. And it literally forced Ebert and his government out of Berlin. They had to leave town for fear for their lives. Ebert's response, and it was quite the brilliant one, he's the leader of the SPD. The working class is with him. He's the leader of the socialists. He calls a general strike. The whole country shuts down. Yeah. Well, that's a good way to end any kind of support that the military might have had. The, the unions forced this coup to its knees. It ended. And at the end of this general strike, the SPD and its ability to restore some order gave them a little boost in the popularity ratings. So they were back in business. But the events of early 1920 would underscore the central flaw of Weimar, the extreme fragmentation of German society that destroyed all the good intentions of the Weimar Constitution. And this was amply represented in Germany's party system. Another one. There you have it. This brings up one of my favorite phrases of political science, and especially in comparative politics for all my old friends here. Multipolar polarized pluralism. <laughs> what in the name of man is <laughs> So here you see the various sectors in the German part. And this, these are just the big waves. These are the main parties. You have to keep in mind that even as late as 1928, when briefly they had elections again after a number of emergency clause invocations, 40 parties or more contested the elections. We have trouble keeping track of two. How are you supposed to be able to a system that employs 40? How are you supposed to know the differences? How are you supposed to know the people? What multipolarized pluralism, multipolar polarized pluralism, and even I get it wrong, is that you have here, first of all, great pluralism. In other words, you've got a lot of parties. You have a number of ideological poles. The center, the right, even the extreme right, and the extreme left. Around each of those poles, you have a number of parties. And furthermore, not only do you have that much of a mess, but you have polarization, implying that the ideological range of the parties in the Reichstag runs the gamut from the very far right to the very far left. And in the end, it will be these extremes in the German party system that will unite in a grand embrace of what we call the lunatic fringe to defeat the order of the Weimar Republic. <coughs> Multipolar, polarized, and plural. And as we move into the Weimar Republic, you'll also see a central feature of multipolar, polarized pluralism. It has a centrifugal effect. Where at the beginning, people, as most voters do, the greatest number is at the center of the political spectrum, the greatest support is for the parties of the center, center right, center left, but center. As Weimar goes on, as things become more desperate, those voters will move away from the center and go to the far extremes. Go to the far right, go to the far left, looking for an answer where no legitimate answer is forthcoming. So after the Kupp Putsch in 1920, ultimately, the parties of the so-called Weimar Coalition, the SPD, center-left, the center party, ZP, and the Democratic Party, they're going to lose their control of the government. They lose their Reichstag majority. And they will never again recover a majority coalition. From that time forward, 
No coalition has a majority in Parliament. How can you get anything done? Well, that's the problem. They couldn't. And any attempt they made to devise some kind of answer to the increasing economic catastrophe that was Weimar would be defeated by their political foes because they wanted power and they wanted them out. That's what happens when you have a fractionalized parliament or Congress. In the 14 years of the Weimar Republic, there would be 20 different governments. The longest would last two years, and that was, that was old, you know, by their standards. Too many parties, too little compromise. But as we know, you can have two parties and have too little compromise, but this isn't a lecture on American politics. The classic feature of parliamentary systems with proportional representation with no or a very low political threshold. What do we mean by that? What's an electoral threshold? Where are my people? You know what an electoral threshold is. You've forgotten? How quickly? Not quite. That's close. Let me tell you, it's a minimum percentage you need to get into Parliament. So if you have a proportional representation system, in most, many places throughout Europe now, you, even if you get a lot of votes in the election, you still must have, for example, at least 5% of the vote to get into Parliament. In other places, the threshold may be as low as Israel being a good case. Well, that's fine. It's more democratic, right? Yeah. Also more chaotic. Yeah. Weimar had virtually no threshold. So you could go out and you know, wear a sandwich board and get past him. He knows about elections and what you need to get in. But that's the problem. Too many parties in the Reichstag, no possibility of a solid majority governing. Parties engaged in this tribalism, but they were more than just political organizations. People didn't leave their political parties to the Reichstag. Political parties were a way of life. They embraced auxiliary organizations, soccer leagues, daycare centers. Newspapers, parties even had paramilitary organizations. They had their own backup. Yeah? They had their own thugs. Until the 1930s, most voters remained loyal to their parties. But after the chaos of those early years, support for the DNVP over here and the DVP greatly increased, not so much yet for the Nazis. It's the election of 1928 that will really propel the Nazis forward. And they would very suddenly become that desperate answer to all the problems of the Weimar coalition. The Nazis would expand their parliamentary base from 12 seats in the Reichstag in 1928 to 288 five years later. That's a good track record. The other compelling reason for the failure of Versailles, of, of, <laughs> eh, give away the best point, for the failure of Weimar is, of course, the Treaty of Versailles. Those are the big four the men who signed the Treaty of Versailles and were all too happy to signal the death knell of Germany as they had known it. Lloyd George, Orlando of Italy, Clemenceau of France, and Woodrow Wilson. The Germans were faced with the option of signing the treaty or being occupied. Well, that's no option. 
The Treaty of Versailles was referred to as a diktat. It was designed to punish the country, and punish indeed it did. It was based on the premise that Germany had deliberately started the war. And it was intended to prevent Germany from ever again emerging as a political or military power. The infamous Article 231, the War Guilt Clause, placed all blame for the war squarely on Germany's shoulders. And this was the legal basis for the reparations claims. Germany lost alsace lorraine it lost Upper Silesia, and it lost its entire colonial empire. Its army was reduced to 100,000 volunteers. It had no air force. It had a negligible navy. The air force, navy, and army war colleges were eliminated, and so were the arms industries. Entry of Germany into the League of Nations, ironically, was forbidden. And unspecified reparations at the time of the signing would, of course, turn out to be exorbitant. For all of the polarization and all of the fragmentation of Weimar's polity, there was one thing, one issue, over which everyone, from Nazis to communists and all the way in between, could agree. The Treaty of Versailles was inherently unjust. And who did the Germans blame for Versailles? The Republic the parties of the Republic, their Republican government who had sued for peace. Paul von Hindenburg, is that who's coming home? No, this is the Hall of Mirrors at the Versailles Palace where the treaty was signed. Paul von Hindenburg was, of course, the great field marshal of World War I of the Reichswehr and president of the Republic, the Weimar Republic, from 1925 on, and he put it quite well in terms of understanding what the general attitude was. We, the German people, all of its classes, reject with one voice the charge that Germany is guilty of this greatest of all wars. With pure hearts, we came to the defense of the fatherland. With clean hands, the German army took up the sword. Germany's fledgling democracy was left to its own devices. There was no support for its novel institutions and a completely foreign political environment. And Weimar's failure to deal with growing political and economic crises quickly turned Germans completely against the alien political system. Nationalists would see this, and they would take full advantage. And they would provoke this sentiment, advancing the Dorfstoss theory at the same time, and blaming the disintegrating state of the German nation on a conspiracy, a conspiracy of Jews and socialists. Weimar was commonly referred to as the Jew Republic. In other words, the Germans had not really lost the war. The socialists and their Jewish backers had sued for peace when there was no reason to give up. Our armies were not defeated. And this myth would persist throughout them. At the beginning, and even into its early years, Weimar did accomplish some things. They had achieved great social improvements. Germany's social welfare system, which began when Bismarck really got underway with some significant reforms during the Weimar Republic. Most of us are familiar with Weimar's fantastic period of cultural and artistic awakening. It was a very liberal society in many places. Many viewed Weimar culture as a genuine new birth and Germany had created a new political system, 
mean, it was a democracy times 10. It was more democratic than what was going on in Great Britain. It was more democratic than what the French were dealing with at that time. It was too democratic. Weimar politics were loud. They were contentious. They were unruly. And as I just said, almost any party could put together enough votes to get into the next one. Weimar politics became mass politics in a way that was unknown before. Women could vote. They couldn't hear. There were new parties. There were new movements of every variety. And there were no restrictions on who could join what. It was a great political free-for-all. In the 1920s, no other country had as wide a range of free speech, as vital a public sphere as did Germany. And it was that vital and freewheeling public sphere that created a chaos so rampant that it demanded order, discipline, militaristic order. The politics in Weimar were so contentious that its stability was threatened from the outset. And while many embraced this great expansion of Weimar's political stage, just as many rejected the very premise of democracy, and they were absolutely determined to provoke its collapse. Things fell apart quickly when the pain of reparations became apparent. The government's ploy for dealing with its inability to keep up with the reparation scale was print more money. Worse for Greece. Money that had less value. In the immediate post-war period, the mark, Germany's currency, would fall by a third. Now at the outset, this worked to Germany's benefit. your currency depreciating by a third help you out? How could it? What happened? Where might economists? Well, your goods and services people. cheaper overall. Yeah, people buy more of your goods because they're cheaper. Your goods and services are cheaper abroad. It makes the balance of payments a lot more easier to balance. Well, that didn't last too long. It made German products cheaper and more attractive on international markets, and it allowed German businesses to meet workers' demands for higher wages. But what often happens when a government prints too much money, inflation would soon kick in to hyperinflation. And it was a hyperinflation the likes of which we have rarely seen before or since. So the stories about Weimar's inflation are legendary, but this is as good a picture as any. He's sweeping up Reichsmarks because it wasn't worth the time it took to bend over and pick them up. Yeah. Workers demanded to be paid before noon because if they waited until after lunch, they wouldn't be able to buy nearly as much as they had after breakfast. Some woman was waiting in line for a loaf of bread. And she got called to wait for a minute. She left her basket there filled with the rice marks necessary to buy that loaf. She came back and the marks were there, but the basket was gone. The French response to a shortfall in Germany's ability to pay its reparations was to invade the Ruhr. That's Germany's industrial belt in 1923. Once again, the old glory. The Weimar government called for a government-backed strike to make sure that the French wouldn't get any coal for their trouble. The French responded by sending in their own workers, but they couldn't figure out what to do with those German machines, so that didn't work very well either. A spiraling hyperinflation ensued. Within six months, the Reichsmark collapsed. In August of 1923, one dollar was worth 4.6 million marks. 
Three months later, in November of 23, a dollar was worth 4.2 trillion marks. Now that's inflation. Another slide. You'd probably feel good if you were carrying around something in your wallet that said 50 million. Yeah? That wouldn't even buy you that little bread by November of 23. And the government kept printing money. All confidence in the Weimar government was lost at this juncture. You can understand why. The middle class was wiped out. Savings were extinguished. They weren't worth anything. Unemployment soared. Food riots were very common. The left and the right moved to take full advantage of the debilitated state of the republic. The communists were again beating the drums for a general revolution, and Bavaria became a hotbed of radical right activity. So, November 8, 1923, we have the infamous Beer Hall Push, at the end of which Adolf ends up in prison and he writes Mein Kampf. But in response to the Beer Hall Push, Ebert invokes another infamous article of the Weimar Constitution, Article 48, the Emergency Clause. And this is what would allow the army to restore order. It did, but Weimar never fully recovered from the instability of 1923. All that sent centripetal effect of multipolar polarized pluralism really begins to take shape now, at least start. And things are looking pretty grim until there's a grace from the West in the form of the Dawes Plan. And the Dawes Plan was the design of an American banker with the support of the American government named uh, the noted American banker Charles Willis. And this plan was designed to revise the schedule and the amount of Germany's reparations so that they wouldn't have to pay as much as quickly. It would give them a breather. And at the same time, once there was even a hint of stability, we started sending in some loans. Loans that would permit the Germans to get back on their economic feet, to continue to make their payments to the French and to the British, and make everybody a little bit more content with what was going on, and put much less stress on the government. Germany calmed down, politically and economically. Again, there was no reduction in the number of parties. As I already said, in the elections of 1928, 41 parties will contest the election. In 1928, the far right was marginalized. The Nazis weren't a big factor yet, but this proved to be short-lived. The major figure of this middle period was quite an optimistic one for the Germans, for Americans who were very anxious to see Germany succeed, at least economically. I mean, they're a major Central European market, and Germany is where Germany is. You can't just bypass it. Yeah? So much as was the case when we instituted the Marshall Plan at the end of World War II, the Dawes Plan was the post-World War I version. We have to have stability in Europe, or we're not going to be stable. Simple. Gustav Schwesemann was a member of that DDP, the Liberal Party. And he was a classic European liberal. And he was very much for international cooperation, international order. But he was always a nationalist. He was not going to agree that Germany had to accept the blame for World War I. He wasn't going to agree that Germany should be part of some third tier of the post-war European order. But he cooperated and he truly negotiated a period of peace and relative prosperity in Europe during those years. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for what he accomplished during this period. 
But then came October 1929. What starts as a stock market crash on Wall Street quickly turns into a banking crisis and then becomes a production crisis. Politically, the institutions of Weimar never supported stability. They never supported political efficacy. The Constitution was the darling of democratic constitutions. It afforded more admirable liberties and more inadequate protections of those liberties than any other constitution of its day. The electoral law supported universal suffrage, where virtually no other nation at that time had universal suffrage. Everyone over 20 could vote. Previously, only men over 25. But there was too much choice. The perfect parliamentary democracy was never able to craft coherent and effective policy. In the ensuing crisis, after the stock market crash of 29, every party of the governing coalition quickly resorted to a very familiar political practice. They all tried to scratch out their own political turf. Where there had been little political compromise, there was now virtually none. The key political issue of the time was how to fund what the Social Democrats had created, and it was something called the Unemployment Insurance Fund. This was revolutionary. This was something completely new in Europe. This was something that we haven't heard anybody speak of in the United States yet, at least not in the center. Yeah. No one at the time this unemployment insurance fund was created, envisioned the unemployment that would come with the Great Depression. The political fractures that erupted over this issue rendered the Reichstag lame. It couldn't do anything. It couldn't get anything passed. Kind of like what I see in the next two years, but that's another problem. They were completely incapable of running the country. Von Hindenburg resorts to the infamous Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution, the Emergency Clause. And he thereby governs Germany by presidential decree for the remaining three years of the Republic. Rather than an extreme measure to preserve the Republic, the dictatorship evolved into a plot to overturn Weimar from within. By 1932, the people of Germany were disgusted with their democratic experiment and with the government's inability to lift the weight of this economic blight that had descended on them. The government resumed elections. <coughs> The two elections that occurred in 1932 allowed no party, obviously, to claim a majority and no coalition that could effectively govern. The result, more fracturing of the political turf, complete disdain for any of the parties that had heretofore participated in government during Weimar and the, the ascendance of the Nazis the Nazi surge into the Reichstag. And so, through a perfectly legal election, the Nazis become the dominant force in the Reichstag, and at the end of January 1933, Adolf Hitler is appointed chancellor. He refuses to serve in the cabinet unless it is as chancellor. That was his one condition. Von Hindenburg is quite happy to accommodate him because he is convinced by his moderate right supporters that, oh, we can control those silly Nazis. Just all cock and bluster. Parliament was dissolved in a week. Within a month, a disgruntled Dutchman, the 
communist by the name of Marius van der Lubbe would allegedly set fire to the Reichstag. Hitler and Goebbels blame the Nazis. Hitler seizes on this to insist the communists were on the verge of a national revolt. Shortly thereafter, the Enabling Act is passed in the Reichstag, which severely curtails civil liberties and grants Hitler authority to rule by decree. Later that year, all political parties were formally banned. The final Reichstag elections, called in November of 1933, gave the Nazis 95.2% of the vote. And so, as one analyst put it, the entire Third Reich can be considered a state of exception. And that's the story of how Weimar precipitated the rise of the Nazis. combination of the two. Because it, it, it seems that, as you were saying, that there was a period, a short period of stability where it seemed like the institutions of the Weimar would, would be able to come together and do something because the economic climate had yeah. stabilized. So, I agree. so if, if the economic climate had not stabilized, how can you... I'm, I'm just, can, can you, keep, you keep coming back to the fact that it was the Weimar Republic itself that precipitated the rise of the Nazis. Is there anything... Well, that economic climate was also part of the Weimar Republic. But what I'm suggesting is that the institutions of the Weimar Republic and their extreme democracy uh, didn't give the Weimar Republic political safeguards such as most democracies enjoy, most democracies rely on. It's quite true, as the gentleman suggests, if things were not so economically wretched during this period, Weimar would have had a fighting chance. And they probably would have come to the realization that they needed to employ a higher electoral threshold. They needed to employ some different kind of a political party system. They needed to establish some better relations between executive, legislative, a stronger judiciary. And over time, it would also have been true that the supporters of the ancien regime would die off. We can always wait for that. But it didn't. And what we can say is that given the horrible economic terms of the time, nothing about the Weimar Republic made it easier. Other questions? Well, you've suffered enough for the first day. So we'll see you next week. Okay.